Hey everybody, Donna Schwartz here. Early this week on a Wednesday, September 14th. I had a whole bunch of really uh, terrific questions. I've got them right here. I'm going to answer them. And most of them are saxophone related, but some of them can definitely apply to uh, other instruments as well. So for you music teachers out there, um, this one may be good for you. Let me start with this question because this is, this is pretty simple. Uh, someone asked, can someone that's 4 feet 10 inches play the tenor sax? I've taught um, elementary band for a long time, and one of the things that I considered, not necessarily, it wasn't necessarily their height. What's really more important, uh, because, I, because I'm not that tall, <laughs> and I play tenor most of the time, what's really more important is your, your hand size. Um, if your hands don't reach around the keys, meaning around the palm keys and also the side keys, that's going to affect your sound more than how tall you are, okay? So, you know, if you're thinking about playing the tenor and you're short or vertically challenged like I am, it's more about your hand position. So see if, um, if your hands can reach around. Just make a big fat C, pretend like you're holding a softball in each hand, and make sure that you could reach around those keys without pressing into them. Now that includes, what I used to do with, with my kids is I'd have them sit down in a chair, and we're talking third graders actually at the time. Um, I'd have them sit down in the chair, I'd put a uh, padded neck strap on them, and I'd make them hold an instrument, a saxophone in their hands, uh, whether it was outdoor or tenor. I'd have them hold it up, and I'd make sure that their hands reached around the keys. Because if they're not reaching around the keys, and they're pressing into them, you're not going to get a sound out. Instead, you're going to get squeaks, squawks, and then what happens is the person quits because they think they stink. No, it's just your hands aren't big enough yet. And then the alternative was, um, and I could say this because a lot of great saxophone players started on clarinet, is to go with the clarinet for a few years. You'll get amazing technique, and then you could bring that amazing technique to the saxophone. Okay, so, um, you know, someone who's four foot ten, hey, if your hands are big enough, cool. If not, Try an alto, see if your hands are big enough for that. If not, go to the clarinet. All right, next question. Um, how to finger faster? So someone basically, uh, they have a student, and um, the basic gist of it was that their fingers were, something, they were doing something with their left thumb that was a little wonky, <laughs> and I didn't quite understand uh, the person's solution, but what it made me think about was this great tip I got from a, um, my former student teacher who's now a colleague, okay, but he's across the country. He's a great teacher. He gave me this tip from a shared mentor of ours. If you want to really learn how to play things that are fast, I have two answers to that. The first one, let's get technical. Uh, you got to keep your fingers on top of the keys or just very close. A lot of people, when they play a woodwind instrument, have their fingers in like another country, okay? They're like out here. Your fingers should, as our, our shared mentor said, either rest or press. Rest or press. Rest or press. You can get into that routine, uh, that routine chant with your students, okay? And that, that'll get them going. Now, if they're having a hard time resting their fingers on top of the keys or being close, <laughs> this was the awesome tip. Get some double-sided tape. Okay, and stick it on the keys, so this way that their fingers are on the keys and it's going to force them to keep them close. So it's, what are you doing? You're basically retraining your muscles so that you're keeping your fingers close because you need that. As a woodwind player, you do, you do very fast passages. Now, can you do that on a clarinet? No. Okay, obviously not. But on a saxophone, you can do that and you can do that on a flute. Now, the second part to that answer is this. If you want to play something fast, you have to play it slow, all right? And there's plenty of, of people that, you know, definitely agree with that. You can't play something fast unless you can play it slow. So if you've got something that's like quarter note equals 300, well, guess what? You're going to start at quarter note equals 48. And make sure you get it slow. Make sure that all the connections between the notes are really solid. You're not getting stuff in between the notes. And you, you keep bumping up the metronome. Um, every time and you stop the metronome when your fingers start to get jumbled when your brain starts to get confused when you start hearing stuff in between the notes and then the next day you put the metronome a couple of notches lower than what your limit was the day before you work through the passage and you keep bumping up the metronome again it's all about training your muscles 
okay, whatever muscles you're using, okay, training your body. So, uh, again, two-pronged answer, how to finger things faster, the technical thing, the funny little thing, double-sided tape on woodwind instruments. You could also do this on trumpet, too, by the way, not on trombone. Um, you could also do this on trumpet valves, too. People tend to do this, or they tend to use the, uh, the wrong part of their fingers when, when they're fingering. They tend to do this. And you know what? Let me get into this for a second, too. If you tend to finger like this, or um, let me think of another one would be. Oh, yeah. Collapsing the hand. All right, you see some jazz people do that. Here's the thing, though. When you're a beginner starting out, uh, not a good idea. Especially if you've got a rental horn. Here's another issue, too. You've got a rental horn. You just, you've just inherited the previous players, the previous musicians' fingering problems. A lot of times when people first get a horn, they start fingering this way. You affect how the valves go down. Okay, they're not really going down totally straight. You're kind of pushing them a little bit at an angle. So you really want to get in the habit of your fingertips being on top of the valves. You make a nice big fat C. Thumb here. Fingertips on top of the valves, and do not hook the pinky in the ring. That's only for turning pages, okay? It's one-handed playing or using a mute, all right? So this should be your right-hand position right there. Some people do this where you just place the thumb on the first valve casing. That's fine, too, but this, this, is, this is fine. No collapsing the hand, just boom, right up there, okay? So um, fingering faster. Okay, next question. What's the normal amount of biting on top of the saxophone mouthpiece? Should the mouthpiece patch or the mouthpiece have huge marks and chunks taken out? Okay, um, eons ago when I first started playing, I, I would notice that there were some pretty big bite marks on the top of my mouthpiece. And um, I would notice that with my students as well. The, the thing, though, is this. You don't want to be biting down so hard because that downward pressure, my first thought when you do that and remembering back to the day was that you, that means that your bottom lip is probably not putting the, a uh, solid amount of uh, pressure against the reed and it's not coming up straight against the reed. Instead, you're focusing too much down as opposed to just, you know, thinking the letter F or V just like that. And when you do that, there's hardly any there's hardly any pressure with your top teeth. If you're pressing down too hard, you're also creating tension, unnecessary tension in your body. Um, when you create unnecessary tension in your body, you don't just feel it in that one spot. So here's an analogy or an example. You take your whatever hand, your dominant hand, make a fist. Now, are you feeling tension just in the fist or are you feeling it somewhere else? Right now, I'm feeling it at my forearm, my elbow, my shoulder, my shoulder blade, actually down to my ribs on the right side, okay? All that unnecessary tension means that you're not going to take a relaxed breath, means that your sound's not going to be relaxed. So unnecessary tension here, really biting down. I'm already feeling it like on the top part of my jaw. It's creating tension up here too, okay? So... Make it simple for yourself. You know, you don't need to bite down so hard. It's as simple as saying F or V. That's it. Okay, work, in, work that in, and that's going to really help you with that. Um, another question. Boy, I'm booming through these this week. Cool. Thanks for all the questions, guys. Please share this. Share this right now while we're live. And you know what? If you're watching this on the replay, cool. Thank you. Share the replay as well. This will help uh, your fellow musicians and your fellow music teachers. Thanks. And by the way, um, also check out my website, donnaschwartzmusic.com. Okay, got a lot of good articles up there. Um, the latest article is an interview. It's actually an article and radio show. I have a show on the BAM Radio Network, and my um, recent guest is Nick Manella from the 10-Minute Jazz Lesson Podcast, an awesome podcast for you to check out if you want to learn some great patterns, some great ideas, some great approaches to learning jazz. Um, so I interviewed Nick Manella, and the first part of our two-part series talked about the importance of warming up, not only just, you know, for the sake of warming up, but to make a great practice session, to make a great performance, to improve your tone, to also wake your brain up, 
a warm-up isn't just let's mindlessly blow some notes and mindlessly blow some scales. A warm-up is to wake your brain up. It's to coordinate your brain, your body, your fingers, your air, your articulation, all that kind of stuff. So if you want to read about that, go to my website, DonnaSchwartzMusic.com. Click on the blog button, or you'll see all the way in the bottom my latest blog post with Nick, and you'll be able to click on the link within the article to check out the radio show. And please share that as well. Okay, so moving on. Next question I got. Why does it take so much effort to play a brand new read? Hmm. I can't play more than 40 minutes. Um, you know, I conk out. My muscles start to, like, really just go bonkers. All right. My first thought to this first question, why does it take so much effort to play a brand new read? Okay. Couple of things. Number one, are you rotating your reads? If you're not... Um, what you're doing then is you're taking one read, you're playing it until you kill it. <laughs> you're playing it straight for like two or three weeks. And by that time, it's losing its strength. It's losing its strength to the point where when it's finally dead and it's not doing anything for you and you chuck it, you add a new read. It feels like you have a whole big new tree in your mouth. Okay. Um, it feels very thick. It feels stiff. It feels like you have to bite to get the sound. Here's a better solution to that. The first part of this. Rotate your reads. Rotate your reads uh, between at least two different reads. Honestly, four is better. How do you do that? You get a read holder that holds four reads. You either the, label the read holder. A lot of them are labeled. If not, get some stickers on them. Green, uh, green, you know, purple, blue, red, okay? Label your reads. Your best one is your number one. Your not-so-great one is number four, okay? But you rotate the reads. Go through them. So that day one, you're playing read one. Day two, you're playing read two. Day three, you get the idea? Your reads are going to last longer. They're all going to be around the same strength for a longer period of time so that when one goes, it gets replaced. You move the reads up in the read cycle, and, um, and you go from there, okay? So that's the first thing in terms of so much effort with a brand-new read. Now, the other thing I'm thinking about, too, is that that person probably got in the habit of biting in order to get a sound to come out. So you've really got to work on the muscles in your mouth to not do this, to bunch your chin. So I'm going to say to you, watch yourself in a mirror and make sure you're not going. If you're doing this, you're biting, that hurts, and it just goes haywire from there, okay? So definitely, uh, definitely check into that. The other thing this person was saying is that he can't play for more than 40 minutes at a time. I have an article on my website called Maximizing Your Practice Using the Rule of Tens. And the basic premise is this. As adults, uh, our attention span has really drastically fallen to the point where, you know, we, we're having a hard time concentrating for more than a, a few minutes at a time. In fact, they've said that because of social media, Goldfish have a better attention span. That's not good. But anyway, I digress a little bit. We want to make sure that when we're practicing, we're practicing with a purpose. We're not just practicing to just, again, blow scales, blow mo notes mindlessly. You want to be very focused and aware of what you're doing when you're practicing so that you make progress. If you're, if you're finding that you're not making progress on your instrument, and you're going through the right routines and all that kind of stuff, it's probably because you're not mindfully practicing. Here's what's going to help that. The rule of tens is basically this. You focus on, I call it three uh, areas, tone, technique, and music. You focus on tone for 10 minutes, then you focus on technique for 10 minutes, focus on music for 10 minutes, put the horn down, do something else for a little bit. Come back later if you have the time, another 30 minute period divided into threes, right? 10 on tone, 10 on technique, 10 on music. If you're a professional, 30 minutes is not enough. So professionals are going to vary that. They're going to spend a lot more time on their tone. Um, they're going to spend a lot more time on each, on each category. Um, but they can, they can basically handle that. That's the, that's the point about that. But when you're just starting out or you've been playing a few years or you know, you're, um, you know you're, this is a hobby for you and you're just trying to find as much time as you can to practice, break your practicing down into 10-minute segments and focus it on tone, focus it on technique, and fo focus it on music. 
that's going to help build up your muscles too. I find um, I had one student who would practice for like two hours straight and wonder why he'd be exhausted at the end. Well, you know, it's sort of like going into the gym and lifting the heaviest weights you possibly can and you're keeping doing it over and over and over again. You're going to get exhausted, you're right? It's common sense. So get smart about it. Break down your practicing. Take breaks, okay? As a brass player, I know we're always told rest as long as you play. We don't need to do that as much on a woodwind instrument, but you should do it at some point because not only does this need a break, this needs a break too. Okay, so I hope that that answered your question. Um, I also, someone had asked me another question earlier, actually late last week, and it was about how to do vibrato. Well, I created a whole new video for that. You can catch that also on my website, donnaschwartzmusic.com. Go to the free stuff tab, go under woodwinds, and you'll see all the way at the bottom how to do vibrato. Now, it's not actually just for woodwinds. It's also for brass players, too. Um, and it's not for flute players because flute players do a different type of vibrato, okay, as opposed to the jaw vibrato that brass players, saxophone players uh, tend to do. So check out that video on my website. And with that in mind, thanks for joining me. Thanks for watching the replay. Please share it, spread it around, okay? Check out my website, donnaschwartzmusic.com. Lots of articles on there, lots of videos, lots of free stuff. And sign up because right now, you can get the free video, three tips to help fatten up your saxophone sound. And if you're the person that needs a little focus on your practicing and needs a little help with that, go to my, uh, go to my website, find the blog, maximize your practice using the rule of tens. And then if you sign up there, you get a copy of my free ultimate practice planner, which will help you to focus your practicing. Thanks so much for joining me. Have a great rest of the week. We'll talk soon. Take care.